Hello everyone and how are you all doing today? So today we're going to be doing some multiple choice questions for the ACCA performance management exam. The multiple choice questions we're going to be doing are from section B. So section B where you have the sets of five MCQs for a particular topic or scenario. So we're going to be doing the ones from March and June 2019's paper questions 21 to 25. The topic of this is limiting factors. Okay. So without further ado, let's get into the questions. We'll start by reading the actual questions rather than going through the case scenario. So that's an important rule. Rather than reading the case scenario, go to the question, see what the requirement is asking, and then find that specific information needed to solve that question. So the first question is, what is are the limiting factors in month one? And then we have our options, materials, labor, machine hours, etc. Okay. So let's go back up. Month one, we have some information over here. What is this? It says the manufacturing manager is planning production volumes, etc. And these are the resources for month one. Yeah, so these are important. We have our resources over here, materials, labor, machine hours. And with month one, that means we're dealing with this part of the situation. Okay, that's fine. And we need to find what the limiting factor is. Well, what other information have they given us? Let's start from the top. Caraco makes two products, Seaback and Herdorf, and they've given the information for each of them over here. Okay, fixed cost is 300,000. That might be important later on. Uh, contribution per unit is uh, 250 and 315 for each of the products. Maximum demand for each month is 4,000 units for Seaback and 3,000 units for Herdorf. Okay. And the product material is fine. Caraco has a legally binding obligation to produce a minimum of 2,000 units for months one and two. There is no minimum obligation in month three. Okay, so right now we're dealing with month one and we have a demand of 4,000 for Seaback and 3,000 for Herdorf and we need to find the limiting factor. Simply put, for each of these limitations, we'll see can we produce the 4,000 and 3,000 units within these limitations. We don't need to worry about this minimum 2,000 because the demand is already accounting for that because we'll be looking for 3,000 units. So first let's start with materials. For materials, that's 5 kg for Seaback. So 5 into 4,000. So 5 kg for Seaback and there's 4,000 units of Seaback. So we ultimately end up with 5 into 4,000, which is 20,000. And there's 7 kg for Herdorf and 3,000 units. So plus 7 into 3,000. So this will give us 41,000, 20,000 plus 21,000. And as we can see materials, we only have 34,000. So yes, materials is a limiting factor. Okay. Then we have your labor. So two hours of labor and 4,000 units of feedback. So that's 8,000 for feedback. And uh, three hours of labor for herd of per unit and 3,000 units, that's 9,000. So we end up with 17,000 for labor. And we have 18,000, so labor is not a limiting factor. Finally, machine hours, three hours into 4,000 for Seaback, so 12,000. And two hours into 3,000 for herd of plus 6,000. So we end up with 18,000. And we have 18,000. So machine hours is not a limiting factor either. So we're left with option number C, that only materials are the limiting factor in month one. Okay. So let's try question number two. Question number two says, the production manager has identified that the only limiting factor in month two is labor hours. Okay, so they've already given us this information. We need to go by it. Okay, what is the production volume for herd of for month two? So we need to be careful herd of, okay, not feedback, given that labor hours is our limiting factor. So let's go back up. Okay, so we need to find how much production for herd of 
given that labor hours for month two is our limiting factor. So we have 12,000 labor hours. How many units of Ferdorf would we produce in that? So whenever there's a limiting factor given, we need to rank the products to make the optimum production plan. In this case, it'll be contribution per limiting factor, which is labor hours. But what we underlined over here, there's a minimum of 2,000 units of Ferdorf required in months one and two. So we're gonna be providing this minimum of 2,000 either way, regardless of the optimum production plan. And for those 2,000 units, it'll be labor hours of three hours per unit. So 2,000 into three, 6,000 will already be taken from this 12,000. So 12,000 less the 6,000 will be left with 6,000 labor hours for our optimum production plan. And we already have 2,000 units of heard of. Will we reduce any more units? Let's find out. So for the optimum production plan, we take the contribution per unit for each. So see back it's 250 and heard of it's 315 and then find the contribution per limiting factor, which is labor hour. So there's two labor hours per unit of CBAC. So 250 over two, if we use our calculator, 250 over two, we get 125. So for CBAC contribution per labor hour is 125, right? So contribution per labor hour, okay? And for herd of 315 over three labor hours. So we get, you know, 15 over 3, 105. So ranking wise, CBAC has a higher contribution for limit labor hour. It will be ranked first. So we'll first produce CBAC, the 4,000 units, and then we'll go on to produce herd of if we have enough labor hours left. So 4,000 units of CBAC at two hours per unit would take up 8,000. But we only have 6,000 labor hours remaining meaning we'll produce as many of feedback as we can, but we won't have any left over to produce all of them or to produce any of the remaining units of herd of. So we'll be left with producing only 2000 units of herd of under this production plan. So number 22 would be 2000 units. And as you can see, just by the minimum demand fact, we could have eliminated A and B right from the get-go because the minimum demand of 2,000 must be fulfilled. So it's either gonna be 2,000 or more than that, okay? Next, let's do question number 23. So shadow pricing, it says, if the shadow price for month two is $125 per labor hour, just to recap, what was shadow price? It is the extra contribution you earn for each extra, unit of uh, limiting factor that you have. So in this case, for each extra labor hour you get beyond the limitation, you will earn $125 in contribution overall, okay? Which of the following statements are correct? So the production manager would be willing to pay existing staff a maximum overtime premium of $125 per hour for the next 2000 hours. So 125 is equivalent to the shadow price here. And that's true. So Overtime premium means this is above and beyond the regular salary or labor cost. So you're making, a, and this 125 is what we made after deducting the salary or labor cost. So if we pay up to 125, we won't be making a loss on the unit. If we start paying up overtime premium of more than the shadow price, we'll start making a loss, right? So this is correct. One is correct because we have a capacity of up to $125 contribution we can use to pay any premium or overtime that we need, okay? The production manager would be willing to pay a maximum of $170 per hour for an additional 2,000 hours of temporary staff time. So what about this 170 though? Didn't we just say 125 is our limit? Well, that's for overtime premium. Here's the thing, maximum of 170. Not overtime premium, just the overall pay of 170. So what do we compare this to? So if we break it down, right, we have contribution, which is sales minus variable cost is contribution, right? They're saying contribution is shadow price 125, right? So this is how much we're left over with. So if we pay a premium on top of our costs, which are here, we can afford to pay them out of here, right? Okay. But the total amount that we're willing to pay, 170, should be equivalent to this value, meaning the cost and the remaining contribution we have to pay, play with. So what is the cost per labor hour in this question? That's what we need to know, okay? So if we go back up, labor hours are $45 per hour. So let's go back down. 
meaning this is 45. So 125 plus 45 does in fact give us 170. So it's fine. We won't make any profit if we pay them 170, but if we pay them 170, that includes the $45 cost we would have paid them, and we the rest we can pay out of the contribution we made from that extra hour of work. So yes, that's fine. We can pay up to 170. So both one and two. And this is a common type of shadow price question. Okay, so the bottom line is when it comes to overtime premium, equate it to your shadow price. When it comes to the overall price for the labor hour, find the total of the shadow price and the cost per labor hour and match it to that. Okay. Next question, number 24. What is the maximum profit which can be earned in month three? Okay, so now we're up to month three. So we have our graph which we haven't used so far. Oh, and it is for month three. So that's gonna be what we're counting on. Okay, so if the graph is given for month three and we have our data above of all of these limitations, Whenever we have a linear programming graph and we need to find the maximum profit, we need to first find the optimal point. How do we find the optimal point? We take the ISO contribution line, which is this line over here in this case, and we push it outwards using a ruler and see how much outwards it can be pushed while staying within all the constraints. Okay, and we have all these different constraint lines throughout, right? Now, in this case, it's interesting because there's a constraint line going up here and there's a constraint line going like this. And then there's some constraints way out there beyond all of these limitations. So basically, we cannot push beyond this region over here because these two constraints are stopping us. What that means is, and remember, the optimum point is usually a corner point. So it's either going to be this point unlikely this point unlikely as well so it's likely this point right and if we use a ruler and push it out i'm sure that's what we'll get to so at this point is our optimum point and the optimum point gives us our optimum production plan of how many units to produce in this case we produce this many units which is the constraint line where h being heard of i'm assuming is 3000 units okay that's one constraint the other constraint for this point is 2000 units yeah, of C back, okay, S and H is heard of, okay. So our optimum production plan would be in this case, 3000 units of heard of and 2000 units of C back. So let's see what profit we would earn if we sell them accordingly. So if we go back up, we have our contribution per unit for C back and heard of, okay. So heard of, we need 3000 units and C back, we have 2000 units, right? So let's get out our calculator. 2000 into 250 gives us 500,000. Let's just note that down. So 500,000, okay. And 315 into 3000 gives us 945,000, okay. But remember this is our contribution and we need the profit but we have our fixed cost given here 300,000 so we'll subtract those as well minus 300,000 okay so 945,000 plus 500,000 minus 300,000 okay 1145,000 let's go down so monthly, there we go, one one four five thousand. And notice up here, option C is three hundred thousand more than this, and that's an easy mistake students can make. If you don't deduct the fixed cost, you would have this as the answer, and they put it there to make you fall for that trap. So please be careful. Remember that was the maximum contribution. They're asking for the maximum profit, so we needed to deduct fixed cost to get this answer. Okay, so be careful, and they do that a lot put a tricky option there which matches another calculation that you could have done if you missed out on something. They do that, okay? Anyway, which is, last question, question 25. Which of the following interpretations of linear programming graph produced for month three is our correct? Okay, first one, even if demand for either product increases, labor will be a slack variable if no resources change. 
I'm sorry, slack variable. So we have slack constraints and binding constraints. Slack constraints being where we've hit the limit and binding constraints, sorry, sorry, binding constraints being where we've hit the limit and slack constraints being where we still have room to move. Right now, our optimum plan is over here, okay? And this is 12,000 limit. So given the data in the table above for month three, 12,000 limit being the machine hours. So this is machine hours. Where is labor hours? Labor hours, the limit is 24,000. So this one, right? So this is our labor hours constraint, okay? So as we can see from the optimum point vantage point, there's a lot of room until we hit the labor hours constraint. So the machine hours is a binding constraint, but labor hours is a slack constraint, right? This one, S is equal to 4,000. Lots of room to move, there's a slack constraint as well, right? So the first one is correct in that it is a slack constraint. So one is correct, okay? What about two? If more machine hours were made available in month three, they would be initially used to make herd of, okay? Let's find that out as well. So if we look at our graph, they're saying if more machine hours were made available. So yeah, machine hours was our uh, binding constraint. So yeah, that's good, but we'll use them to make herd of. So herd of we were making 3000 units and it's a constraint in its own right, right? The maximum demand of 3,000 units. So no, we won't use it to make herd of. We're already making 3,000 units of herd of, which is the constraint level. There's no point in making any further units because we don't have any demand after that. So instead, we'd be making more of CBAC because CBAC, the constraint is 4,000 and we were only making 2,000 units, okay? So second one is incorrect. So if we go back down, we end up with Second one being incorrect, first one being correct, the answer is A, okay? So that's it, that's our set for linear programming. And linear programming, now that it's a computer-based exam and they can't have you to ask you to draw the graph, it's usually tested in MCQs, right? You could get a section C with all these different types of questions and having to interpret the graph like we had to in this uh, case scenario but you won't have to make a graph, okay? But it's usually tested in the MCQs. And shadow pricing, uh, you need to get that down. Most students struggle with that topic. Interpreting the graph, being careful, knowing how to do this calculation, then what to do where, you need to be conceptually strong. So make sure to review the videos that we covered for this chapter to make sure if you struggle with any of these questions here in the exam, and then come try practice some more questions as well. So I hope this was beneficial for you guys and I'll see you guys next time.